Next on our, on our agenda in the last topic of IDM uh, for this autumn is debate. One of the debate that are actually give us the road to COP27. Greater recognition of the reality of human mobility in climate change negotiations, including the consequences of food insecurity. I have a pleasure to introduce you our moderator, Ambassador Caroline Dumas, Director General Special Envoy for Migration and Climate Action of IOM. Madam, floor is yours. Thank you. Excellencies, colleagues, good afternoon. Uh, dear panelists, if I can say good afternoon. Just a few words to, to, to say and to introduce so this panel to say just a few things. This panel is timely. It is timely for COP. We are just now a small two weeks ahead of COP27, and it is important so to, to talk about what are the subjects which are uh, the core subjects for us, I mean, ahead of COP. We already, as you know, second thing, we already have a framework um, with the Paris Agreement for integrating uh, migration concerns in a climate change treaty. We had the Paris Agreement from uh, COP21 adopted so in 2015, but we also have the VASO uh, International Mechanism for Loss and Damage, uh, and that task force, the specific task force for displacement, which was so um, a result from the whole process, and which is developing recommendations for integrated approaches to avert, minimize, address displacement related to the adverse impacts of climate change. So we, I could add as well that in the last year, we could say that we are pleased, in IOM at least, to see a kind of growing recognition of the importance of human mobility in the context of climate change and a, a better or a higher or a stronger mobilization to provide innovative, sustainable, people-centered solutions. But as you know, we do have to scale up our efforts still to, to do more. The IPCC working to, uh, working to group, I mean, report, which was issued by, by February, helps us in a certain sense because it is the first time that that group of experts linked really climate change impacts to uh, the human being. I mean, there is an approach which is a human lens, if I can say, to scientific data for the first time in the IPCC report. And of course, I mean, the, the conclusions of the IPCC report are extremely uh, worrying for the planet, but as well for human beings, including in terms of forced displacement that we have to expect. So this panel will now help us maybe give even more visibility to this nexus between climate change and human mobility. I hope that this panel can help us create a common understanding on our needs, but as well our goals ahead of COP27, and that this panel will help us maybe to, to be better prepared uh, for, COP, for the COP, COP discussions. So I would like to introduce um, our distinguished panelists today. We will have, well, we have presently, if I can say, state, the State Minister of Environment from the government of Uganda, Honorable Minister Beatrice Aniwar, uh, who is a key player in Africa and more specifically in East Africa, and she will tell you if ever you do not know the Kampala Declaration, she will tell you why and she will tell you more. We do have online the representatives, if I can say, of the Secretary General, uh, Ambassador Rabab Fatima, who is the uh, Under Secretary, High Representative for LDCs, for SEEDs, and for landlocked countries. We do have Ambassador Luigi Soreka, 
with the special envoy of the external action service from the European Union for migration. We will as well listen to Mrs. Pefi Kingi, who is the Pacific Regional Focal Point for Migration for the South Pacific Islander Organization. And last but not least, of course, we, we, we do have as well online uh, Coco Warner, I mean the manager of the Adaptation Division in the United Nations Framework Convention on climate change, she will help us wrap up maybe the discussion. So I'm, I know that uh, Ambassador Rabab Fatima has to, to, to leave early. Just ahead of this, I would propose for those who have not listened to it uh, up to now, to listen to the minister, to Minister Shukri, representing the, the COP presidency or incoming presidency for still a few days and to listen to his words ahead of COP27. Thank you. Mr. Antonio Vettorino, Director General of the International Organization for Migration, Excellencies, distinguished participants. It gives me great pleasure to participate in the second session of the International Dialogue on Migration that addresses one of the most pressing challenges the world is facing today, namely the nexus between climate change and mobility. Climate migration became a reality that has been increasingly recognized as a key global policy issue, which requires coherent and long-term solutions. Frequent and destructive disasters result in the displacement and forced migration of millions of people globally every year. In parallel, slow onset environmental degradation of ecosystems and loss and the implications of human induced environmental changes can trigger displacement and undermine livelihoods and exasperate tensions in many parts of the world. The impacts of environmental degradation and climate change on migratory movements are felt in all regions of the world. Yet it is important to acknowledge the differentiated impacts depending on contextual factors such as economic, social, political, environmental, and personal circumstances. Statistics also show that displacement caused by disasters worldwide is more than double that caused by conflicts. With this bleak situation in mind, we cannot afford to be bystanders major and urgent political efforts to mitigate climate change are critical to avert the most devastating consequences of this crisis on people and their environment. There is a need for a holistic, inclusive and collaborative approach at national, regional and global level with a view to promoting a more climate resilient and migrant inclusive society and economy. In my capacity as the COP27 President-designate, we will seek to focus on enhancing implementation in order to set up rigorous and focused climate actions in cooperation with all relevant stakeholders. We need to ensure greater synergies between the Global Compact for Migration, the Paris Agreement, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, and the 2030 Agenda for sustainable development to scale up action on climate change and migration, which places primarily emphasis on the well being and rights of all humans without discrimination, enhance regular pathways for safe, orderly, and regular migration through fair recruitment that respects human dignity, as well as ensuring that migration remains a choice, not a necessity. Funding gaps must be addressed to help mobilize the necessary resources for disaster risk reduction, climate change mitigation and adaptation, early warning systems and long-term development programs. There is also a need to discuss predictable finance aligned with global climate commitments and the principles of equity and common but differentiated responsibilities to respond to current and future mobility scenarios 
in the context of the adverse effects of climate change and environmental degradation. Moreover, climate and environmental migration is a multi-causal phenomenon that requires comprehensive responses from different policy areas. Therefore, adopting a holistic governmental and societal approach is key to ensure that no one is left behind. Last but not least, we need a paradigm shift on humanitarian programming and funding for climate-induced mobility, given the protracted nature of such crises. Short-term solutions aren't effective or economically sound. Response should adapt to tackle the compounding challenge and bolster resilience. More emphasis should be placed on developmental peace nexus to ensure sustainability and coherence in international efforts and prioritization in disaster preparedness. Excellencies, distinguished participants, before I conclude, I would like to highlight three issues that the COP27 presidency elevated to the top of climate change agenda as they are essential to protecting livelihoods and preventing displacement whilst ensuring a green transition for our world. First, water security. Unpredictability of water cycles caused by severe problems such as water stress, displacement and conflict over resources with a continued lack of adaptation capacity, resilience, financial means and foresight planning and international and regional cooperation, adaptation in the water sector becomes critical to how successful we address the effects of climate change. The Action for Water Adaptation and Resilience Initiative represents a call to address water as key to climate change adaptation and resilience. Second, food security. Agri-food systems are increasingly impacted by climate change. However, Improving these systems offers a unique opportunity to address climate change by building resilience across these systems while reducing emissions. The Food and Agriculture for Sustainable Transformation Initiative aims to be an accelerator to transform agri-food systems, drive effective actions, and avoid duplications. Third, Climate Response for Sustaining Peace Initiative focuses on the climate displacement, peace nexus, and aim at discussing innovative ideas to advance durable solutions and accelerate climate finance for sustaining peace. The initiative will be implemented through activities on the policy, knowledge, and operational fronts to strengthen resilience and address existing gaps. I believe that the COP27 meetings that will start in a few days in Sharm el-Sheikh will provide a timely opportunity to reflect on how to shape response to the related challenges. Because we cannot continue to do business as usual, since failure to act in a coordinated and preventive manner to mitigate and adapt to the adverse effects of climate change and to address displacement and its root causes, could undermine peace, stability, and prosperity in countries of origin and destination alike. I thank you. Sorry, we, we have heard, so the ministers, I mean, Minister Shukri's uh, vision uh, for COP, his ambition as well, which is important to listen to these three important points of agenda, the water security, uh, food security in, these, uh, in that year of protracted crisis and intermingling, if I can say, crisis, and that other dimension, which is the response for sustaining peace, which, is, which in integrates that security dimension along with the, the, the climate, uh, climate impacts, climate change impacts, and the displacement dimension. So it's a strong uh, call as well to address uh, migration dimension in the climate change 
discussion now, and it is, it is really encouraging. So I would like now to give the floor to the voice, if I can say, of the LDCs, of landlocked countries, and of the seas, and so to give, to give the floor to Ambassador Rabat Fatima. Thank you, well thank you, on. Ambassador Duma. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Caroline Duma, distinguished uh, fellow panelists, excellencies, distinguished delegates. Uh, I'm honored to join other distinguished panelists for this very timely session of the International Dialogue and Migration, and I thank the IOM for the kind invitation. Excellencies, my office advocates in favor of the 91 most vulnerable states, the least developed countries, the landlocked developing countries, and the small island developing states. Climate change impacts these countries disproportionately. Last year, the LDCs reported 10% of global economic losses due to disasters, even though they account for just 1.3% of the global GDP. More than 8.5 million people living in the LDCs were displaced due to disasters in the year 2020. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic has wreaked havoc across the world's most vulnerable countries. And the situation in Ukraine has seen rising food, fertilizer, and energy prices. And these all impact on the situation of the people living in the LDCs. The LLDCs are reliant on transit countries for exports and import of goods, including food. Restrictions at international borders aimed at curtailing the spread of COVID-19 have greatly affected the movement of goods and services. There is a similar situation in the SIDS. Many states have been completely closed, impacting on tourism upon which they are heavily reliant, as well as trade, including food imports. In the past two years, the number of severely food insecure people has doubled, from 135 million pre-pandemic to 276 million today. More than half a million people are living in famine conditions, an increase of more than 500% since 2016. The combined effect of climate change and these additional shocks has had a major impact on human mobility in the LDCs, LLDCs, and the SIDS. This has exerted new pressure for displacement, both internally and across international borders. This has been explicitly recognized in international agreements. The Global Compact for Migration includes a dedicated section on natural disasters the adverse effects of climate change and environmental degradation. I had the privilege to serve as the co-facilitator of the Progress Declaration for the first International Migration Review Forum. Climate change also featured prominently in this document, which was adopted by consensus. The Progress Declaration recognizes the adverse effects of climate change, environmental degradation, and natural disasters as drivers of migration. And it recommends strengthening global efforts to enhance the pathways for safe, orderly, and regular migration for those affected by these phenomena. So the question is, what can we do at COP27 to advance the issue? Excellencies, distinguished delegates, I want to raise four points I believe are worth considering. Firstly, we must turn the implementation of existing commitments these are critical to addressing the root causes of human mobility, namely fulfilling the unmet promises, promise of mobilizing $100 billion for climate action in the developing countries, as well as providing expedited funding for adaptation, especially the national adaptation plans and achieving a balance between funding for adaptation and mitigation. And my second point is, I would like to echo the Secretary General's call for early warning systems for all by 2027. I single this issue out as it is especially important for the LDCs, LLDCs, and the SIDS. Putting in place such systems will help prevent the massive losses we have seen over the past decades. With measures in place to save crops and livestock from floods and droughts, we can mitigate some climate-related displacement. And in this, regard, I, in this regard, I draw your attention to the recently adopted Doha Program of Action for the Least Developed Countries. This places special focus on multi-hazard early warning systems. 
Thirdly, Excellencies, I would like to welcome the work of the Task Force on Displacement of the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage. I encourage it, its, further, uh, its further efforts and also an expeditious start, on the start, uh, 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 start to the work of the Santiago Network. My fourth and final point is not related to the UNFCCC architecture. I draw your attention to the lacuna that exists in the protection of persons who have been displaced internationally due to climate change, but who do not fall within the protections granted to refugees. Climate impacts will continue to worsen distinguished delegates. And so will the numbers or number of persons who have lost their homes for means of subsistence, subsistence or whose environments become uninhabitable. We must find ways to ensure their safety. And in conclusion, we must recognize that we are falling short of the requirements to meet the 1.5 degree limit. Whilst th that remains the case, food security will be negatively affected. This will cause a greater displacement of people, especially the most vulnerable. The international community cannot avoid these tackling issues head on sooner that, rather than later. At COP27, the world will be watching. It is a vital opportunity to address the challenges facing the most vulnerable countries in the world by keeping our promises for the full implementation of existing commitments, working smarter, working together, making better use of the instruments that we already have available and addressing the gaps, institutional as well as normative to protect all those displaced by climate change. Madam Moderator, Ambassador, Excellencies, I, I, I shall rest it here and I thank you all for your kind attention and for this opportunity to share a few thoughts. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and thank you for that specific focus on most vulnerable uh, countries, uh, which are too, too many, if I can say, among, um, among the LDCs, among the seeds. And thank you for that call to, to work together to address the gaps, whether in terms of uh, adaptation, in terms of mitigation, in, uh, you, you mentioned the 1.5 and the food and security, which is linked to it in, if we do not uh, have more progress. And uh, of course, in terms of not met commitments in terms of finance and uh, recalling, I mean, that call from the Secretary General of having at least 50% of finance, of climate finance for dedicated to adaptation uh, compared to uh, the finance uh, focused on mitigation. So thank you very much for your, for your intervention. I would like now to give the floor to Minister of State for Environment from the government of Uganda, uh, <laughs> and that specific country which is the, the mother precisely, Mama Mabira, as we say, the mother country, and the minister will tell us, and give the floor so, to Minister Aniwa. Thank you very much. Uh, Your Excellency, the moderator, uh, Carolyn, Your Excellencies, distinguished participants, the ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very grateful to the IOM officials, the Director General and his team, especially the regional um, um, directors, Muhammad and the country chief, uh, Sunasi who has made it possible for us as a country to have even uh, a Kampala declaration and even enabled me to represent my country in this dialogue. Uh, I will address my, my mind to the benefits of integrating human mobility in climate change uh, negotiations. Uh, climate change is inducing human mobility in our region uh, the East and the Horn of Africa is one of the most vulnerable regions to the climate vulnerability and the climate change. Disasters linked to the natural hazards, environmental degradation, and climate change are overlapping drivers of human mobility. The region is most 
affected by floods, landslides, and the tropical cyclones, as well as slow onset events and processes, such as uh, severe droughts, uh, water ri level rise, environmental degradation, and changing rainfall variability. In 2021 uh, alone, 2.6 new disaster dis displacements occurred in the sub-Sahara African. And um, many more people moved as a result of uh, a slow onset processes, such as drought, desertification, and sea level rise. Some people moved avoiding future disasters and climate change impacts, seeking safety and more sustainable life food in the urban centers and other places that are less vulnerable to climate change. Specific to Uganda, the report by the United Nations High Commission for Refugees confirms that Uganda is currently the third largest refugee hosting country in the world, the largest in Africa with more than 1.5 million refugees. This has been driven in part by environmental changes in countries in the East and the Horn of Africa, including prolonged droughts, desertification, flash floods, and land degradation, all of which will likely exacerbate by climate change in the mid, medium and long term. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, fifth session report, the East and the Horn of Africa is projected to be one of the world's, world's most negatively affected by climate change. Arguably, the interplay between climate change conflict, violence, and refugees movement is considered to be particular, particularly striking in this region of ours. Notwithstanding this crisis, the government of Uganda's policy for settling refugees shifts the focus from seeing refugees as a humanitarian obligation to recognizing that refugees settlement being improve, improved services and infrastructure that can serve both the refugees and the residents of the host communities. In so doing, the government required a huge budget to address this increasing problem, but also set up a coherent, coherent and regulatory framework to address these increasing challenges of human mobility. As such, the Kampala Declaration came out of the conference we hosted in Kampala in July and was geared towards developing an integrated approach to climate change induced mobility across the region. It was envisaged that the outcome of the conference in the shape of a declaration will contribute to the rising important topic of human mobility in the context of the climate change at the global level for serious consideration in the 27th Climate Change Conference of Parties, COP27, in Egypt. And this, we were convinced, being an African COP, our issues will be brought to the table. The ministerial declaration placed an urgent call for enhanced cooperation and action to address the following areas of concern. One, the progressive desertification and the land degradation, creating forced mobility of people and life would. Two, unsustainable use of ecosystem and its impact of frequent and intense extreme weather events and by extension, our well-being. Three, the unplanned migration of our people from rural to urban centers as a result of climate change and disasters. Lastly, it is um, that it is limitation of partnerships and financing to respond to the climate crisis adversaries 
affecting the mobility of our people and the livestock in the region. In so doing, we are disastrous, desirous to build an existing commitments and action within different spaces within the UNFCCC processes and the IGAD, the East African Community Initiative, we have also embarked on this. We also, as a region, have collectively identified the main aspect of migration, environment and climate change nexus uh, related to first to, to the East and the Horn of Africa and the declaration of Kampala explicitly outlined the main call to action. Lastly, we think this is relevant to our region, but the challenges uh, remain on making it even wider throughout the African Union, the East African, the IGAD, and the entire continent to embrace this. The impact of food insecurity uh, will have to, on some of the most venerable countries in the world, uh, is not to be overlooked. According to the World Bank Food Security Report, domestic food prices inflation remains high around the world. Information between May and sub to September 2022 shows high inflation in almost low incoming and middle incoming countries to about 88.9% of low incoming countries and 91.1% of the low middle income countries have seen inflation levels above 5% uh, with many experiencing double digit inflation. The share of high income countries with high food prices inflation has equally risen to 85.7%. The report further states that the agricultural price index is 1% point higher. On the specific food average, wheat, maize, rice prices in October 2022 are 18%, 27%, and 10% higher, respectively, than in October 2021. Meanwhile, wheat and maize prices are 38% and 4% higher, respectively, and rise prices 21% lower than in January 2021. The war in Ukraine has altered global patterns of trade, production, and consumption of commodities in ways that will keep prices at higher level through the end of 2024. Uh, in leading to food insecurity, insecurity and inflation. As such, high food prices have triggered a global crisis that is driving millions more into extreme poverty, magnifying hunger and malnutrition. According to the, an IFF paper, about five billion US dollars to seven billion US dollars is in further spending is needed to assist the vulnerable households in 48 countries most affected by the higher food prices and fertilizer import prices. An additional 50 billion US dollars is required to end acute food insecurity over the next 12 months. It is a serious issue. The number of people who are experiencing acute food insecurity and will need urgent assistance is likely to climb to 222 million people in 53 countries and territories. And this is according to uh, Food and Agriculture Organization report. Following the, start, following the start of the war in Ukraine, trade related policies imposed by countries have surged. The global food crisis has been partially made worse by the growing number of food trade restrictions put in places by countries with the goal of increasing domestic supply and reducing prices. As of October 
2022, 21 countries have implemented 26 food export bans and eight have implemented 12 export uh, limiting measures. As part of the comprehensive global response to the ongoing food crisis, the world must act to provide support in areas such as agriculture, uh, nutrition, social protection, water, and irrigation. This financing will include efforts to encourage food and fertilizer production, enhance food systems, facilitate greater trade, and support the vulnerable households and producers. Uh, in advancing this declaration, Kampala Declaration, we have uh, looked at one, an intent to submit the declaration of COP27 presidency. So much about consideration on the agenda, but also send a clear signal of the collective voices within the region on migration and human mobility. With the support of IOM hosting a high-level side effect event at COP27, to launch this declaration, I invite others to join us and in many ways forward-looking aspiration of what we need to do even after COP27. Already the government of South Sudan has accepted to co-host this side event and we appreciate uh, this effort. However, our vulnerability to climate change and its impact puts a spotlight on the engagement of financial institutions and mobilization of climate finance within the climate negotiations and outside. For the past couple of years, developed countries pledged to mobilize, to mobilize 100 billion US dollars to address the climate change. The achievement of the US dollar 100 billion goal would be a key outcome of, 20, uh, of COP27 and the subst uh, subsequent long-term finance, which will include human mobility and displaced persons. It must be factored in to make us feel part and parcel of the process. Our view is that starting formal discussion on the climate finance goal for 2025 onward is key and settling corresponding timelines to conclude this agenda item, say by 2024, and the heart, uh, at the heart of this discussion should be human mobility and the refugees. Finally, friends, in dealing with issues of human mobility and financial discussion should not be centered around loans to address refugee issues, but rather grants and working with entities like the IOM to settle people peacefully, this will be uh, a way to go. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you really, Asante Sana. I want to say more than thank you very much, but Asante Sana. Uh, was here, uh, Lady Minister, for that very rich and comprehensive, I can say, panorama of the challenges, the very compelling and hard challenges face that, that Uganda faces, but as you, you, you have framed it as well, I mean, challenges which are now on the shoulders, if I can say, of Africa, of Eastern Africa, Eastern Africa and the Horn of Africa and uh, on the shoulders, if I can say, of uh, Uganda. The, the burden of the slow onset of the impacts of climate, either slow onset, drought, desertification, and fast onset, the floods. Well, 
you said it, the burden, of course, of the, of the displacement linked to these uh, climate uh, hazards, the burden of refugees coming from other and uh, neighboring uh, countries, but as well the, the burden of the food crisis, which is uh, now uh, jeopardizing, uh, of course, a fragile economic uh, balance with all the everything you said about the, the rise of the prices, of the food prices, meat, rice, um, maize, uh, fertilizers, with the hunger and malnutrition, which is uh, increasing, and a tentative answer and response, which is the Kampala Declaration trying to address most of these challenges in one unique voice, bringing the voices of East Africa. East and Horn of African uh, countries, 12 countries, and uh, that you would like to be heard at COP and uh, that, of course, you would like to, to move forward up to 2024, as you said, Mrs. Minister. So we'll come back on, on these very important points in our discussion. I would like to give the floor now to Ambassador Luigi Soreca who is the uh, special envoy for the European Union for external dimension of migration. The floor is yours. Merci, Madame thank you, Ambassador. You all, uh, let me uh, as well thank you very much, Minister Aniwar, for uh, her uh, strong and passionate intervention uh, uh, that sets uh, very clearly what are the the goals and the objective that we have uh, in front of us in this, uh, in this area. We as EU, we fully recognize the strong impact that disaster and adverse effects of climate change have on human mobility uh, around the world. And uh, human mobility associated with disaster, climate change, and environmental degradation displays even greater number of people than conflict do. Uh, so the bulk of human mobility in the context of climate change is occurring mainly within national borders. The populations that are most affected do not have the means to migrate. And climate-related displacement is largely triggered, as you know better, a com by a complex combination of environmental and socioeconomic factors. And there is clear consensus that climate change acts as a risk multiplier, worsening living conditions that compel people to move. And the uh, climate-related uh, uh, displacement will further impact and disproportionately those who are most vulnerable, who often have few resources to adapt, and if they are able to move, are likely to migrate in precarious conditions, including refugees, IDPs who often reside in climate change hotspot, as we have heard, triggering additional vulnerability and potential secondary uh, displacement. Uh, we are fully aware as EU that uh, despite uh, uh, all the pledges made at COP27, 26 in Glasgow, the global climate action remains insufficient. And ahead of COP27, we must all together to continue pursuing the global ambition of net zero by mid-century. But we also have to make progress on climate finance, adaptation, and loss of damage as agreed in COP26. Uh, the EU and its member states continue to be the world's biggest donor of climate finance. And we will support we will continue to scale up this uh, support. Uh, to advance in the adaptation finance area, we will continue to work with partners to make progress under the Glasgow Sharm el Sheikh work program on the global goal of adaptation at COP27. And we will remain at the forefront of collective effort to deliver on adaptation finance particularly towards the poorest and most vulnerable country and community. Urgent action on the ground is needed 
I'm very pleased that uh, uh, just last uh, night the uh, member states of the European Union in the Council agreed to the common position that the EU will take in COP27. All the environmental ministers uh, uh, declared that they are ready to update the national determined contribution of the EU and its member states in line with the point 29 of the Glasgow Climate, Climate Pact, and a point that uh, has been uh, uh, also raised by the moderator. Uh, they also strongly call on the multinational development banks and development finance institutions to further strengthen their effort, making use of innovative financing instrument, improve access to funding, and supporting the scale-up participation of the private sector. We also support, as has been mentioned before, concrete initiative in the making, such as the strengthening and expansion of early warning system, which can save thousands of lives. And we will welcome and support decision that further operationalize the Santiago network and to strengthen, facilitate, and speed up the provision of technical assistance to vulnerable people and community. Uh, talking about food insecurity, which is a, an extremely serious and enormous humanitarian challenges, uh, migration can be an adaptation a strategy in context of food security. And uh, uh, very recently, we have uh, launched a study uh, in some of the countries, and we have uh, seen that the migratory response to food insecurity varies across country and uh, over time. But the EU total uh, food uh, support for food security continue to amount uh, uh, until 2024, it will be up to 7.7 .7 billion uh, euro that we will uh, 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 con uh, contribute. So, uh, Madam Ambassador, uh, we strongly believe in multilateralism, uh, in working together. This is the key of the work, but we need all together to increase the priority of the topic of climate change driven displacement on the agenda of the relevant international fora starting by COP27. Thank you. Thank you, ver thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. And I would say that this is, um, in a certain way, at least one part, I mean, or a part of one response already from, from uh, main, one of the main uh, parties of COP, of course, the European Union representing the, the, uh, not only the institutions, but the 27 member states. So, I mean, telling us that uh, the European Union wants still to increase uh, its work on adaptation and its support to adaptation finance, as you said, but as well uh, work ahead uh, on the improving the NDCs, for instance, of member states, um, working better with multilateral banks and the private sector to uh, bring innovative instruments of financing, both for adaptation and the mitigation dimension. The early warning systems, which have been already uh, mentioned by several of our, our panelists and working for, I mean, having the Santiago network being oper operationalized, these are really already very positive directions that we take as such. Uh, I would like to underline as well your nearly final command saying that we have as well to integrate, uh, which is absolutely true and, and of course a, a mantra, if I can say, for IOM, we have to integrate migration as an adaptation strategy and it's good news that EU is ready, if I can say, to um, use all that um, these tools, these different, I mean, nexus tools and narrative, if I can say, just uh, the day before COP. So <laughs> we, it, it gives a little bit of hope for the discussions at COP. 
now at COP27, of course, um, now we 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 have uh, we had a successful, if I can say, answer or response for this panel. So we do have two more speakers. I would like to give the floor maybe to Mrs. Peffy Kingi uh, for the South Pacific Islander Organization, and he should be she should be on online, if possible. Nice to meet you, Madam. Merci. Distinguished guests, esteemed leaders, I greet you once, twice, and thrice may I acknowledge our civil society leaders in attendance. Koko whenua se tifa sama sama kakwe se ile nei ne te tui ngala, whakalanga ake ia. My island is a mother of pearl that now no longer glows from the rays of the sun. We seek its restoration. A proverb of the Tuvalu people who relocated from their climate impacted islands of Tuvalu, now residing in Kiowa Island in the northern groups of Fiji. The Waituku people of Tuvalu purchased Kiowa Island in 1946 with monies earned from the American armed forces during World War II, and they settled on Kiowa on the 26th of October, 1947. On the 18th to the 20th of October this year, just last week, our civil society Pacific groups and leaders from all over our Pacific region, lobbyists, activists, human rights defenders, and climate change advocates organized by 350 Pacific for a planning retreat before and for COP27. Kiowa, peace of God's paradise, on which to collaborate and co-draft the Kiowa Culture Emergency Declaration that we shall be presenting on our way to Sham Del Shay. Whilst there last week, we drank of endless supplies of coconuts. We feasted on succulent, plentiful varieties of fresh fruit, the staple talo, the fresh fish, market garden bounty of cucumbers, fresh fish, tomatoes, fresh fish, lettuce, and more fresh fish. Our people seem to have balanced diets, or so we thought, and a reliable source that kept the tables full of the earth, of the best of earth's bounty. However, the real background story was not as grand as the spread of foods on our tables. We were treated like royalty, but after we exited, the locals returned to a challenging life that, was, that we didn't know of, that we didn't appreciate after our meeting. Conversations with the real people who were out at all times of every day, every night preparing for us, hunting, fishing, gardening, climbing coconut trees, they revealed their food supplies Fisheries and agriculture were not as plentiful, nor as previously known by the original Tuvalu settlers. This makes sense, as according to the recent report from the UN Climate uh, Port Panel, extreme changes in weather and ocean conditions have meant that fish catches in some of the tropics are down between 40 and 60 percent. We all know that. They had limited access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food at all times, became a, a concern amongst all families who settled on Kiowa. That it was difficult for the people to import, purchase or obtain other foods, traditional systems for distribution of food, bartering, for example, and the ability of households to buy other food items from the shop or markets had become difficult for Kiowa peoples that the Kiowa farmers and fishermen had noticed that climate impacts brought various risks, physical impacts to ecosystems, agro-ecosystems, agricultural production. They noticed they were not fishing at the same spots as previous, and they do not catch the same volumes as previous. They catch less each time, said one of the young, young fishermen, excuse me. The climate caused noticeable economic impacts on their incomes and trade. They had limited produce and fish, and this would equal no trade, which equaled no fuel, which meant no getting on the boat to the market. That even 
when they have sufficient monies for fuel. They alight at the other island and then they walk for an hour carrying their goods to get to the market early so they were able to sell with their regular customers. That the social impacts on their familial livelihoods, if they do not have cash means their children will go without certain necessary items that the children's nutrition have also been compromised as processed foods have been introduced into their diets for a long while now. That food security and nutrition is compromised as a certainty and they have traced it back to climate impacts on their community. Since talking and taking on climate justice, many of us are following the science to navigate what climate changes mean in practical terms at locality, at villages, and the headlines of Science Daily are screaming and scaring. Rising sea levels mean rising groundwater, and that spells trouble for coastal septic systems, October 11, 2022. Economic impacts of, com of combating sea level rise, July 14, 2021. Sea level rise up four times global average for coastal communities, March 8, 2021. Sea level will rise faster than previously thought research shows, February the 2nd, 2021. Food security threatened by sea level rise. January 18th, 2017. And so, Excellencies, the Pacific region we represent today has evolved significantly, significantly from the Pacific region that once was when our founding fathers met in Wellington, Aotearoa, New Zealand on the 5th to the 7th of August, 1971, to form a regional leadership. That was a time of hope. Many of our island member states were headed to independence. Others were starting off their life as newly independent states. The economic development of our region has been influenced by colonialism. Relatively late and ongoing decolonization and late integration into the global economy and decolonization in the Pacific remains an ongoing process. These are our continued realities. What we all know now, above average rainfall, resulting in widespread flooding can severely impact on food production. Harvests can be delayed, crops and pastures and can be submerged, killed, produce spoiled, produce spoiled. Many of our foods have reduced protein and mineral concentration, reducing their nutritional value, our babies. Harsher climate conditions will increase use of more heat tolerant breeds in beef production, some of which have lower meat quality and reproductive rates. This we all know. More extreme weather conditions are already producing unprecedented flooding across our countries. Recently, the severity of El, El Nino weather system threatened to leave 4 million people in Papua New Guinea without water. The nation is one of the poorest countries in the world. 83% of its food is produced in country, meaning severe weather could be drastic for food security. The decline in water availability caused by climate change, as well as erratic flood drought patterns, has already led to increasingly unstable food prices across the Pacific. Let's consider the demise of our Pacific women. Women are bearing the brunt of our climate crisis and food insecurity. A mother related to me that she could not afford the monies required for fuel for the boat, that would take her to market the next morning so she could sell samosas at $2 a piece so she could feed a family of four children. Given that in many of the world's poorest countries, women are acknowledged as owners of crops rather than land, when extreme weather conditions hit them more vulnerable to destitution, for example, a yield of crops can be totally washed away by a flood, but the land is, is often not. So the crop owner, often a woman, is worse off while the landowner, often a male, does not lose their asset. Women also lack access to timely climate information, despite women managing most household budgets. The Kiowa Island people understood, as did others on mainland, that increasing resilience of food security in the face of climate change calls for many interventions, from social protection to agricultural practices and risk management. The changes on the ground needed for adaptation to climate change in agriculture and food systems for food security and nutrition were required to be enabled by investments, policies and institutions in various areas. These interventions need to be part of integrated strategies and plans. These strategies should be gender sensitive, should be multi-scale, involve many sectors and worked by multi-stakeholders. 
All plans and national strategies should also be supported by enhanced regional and international cooperation. For the world's poor, adapting to climate change and ensuring food security are intertwined. A paradigm shift towards agriculture and food systems that are more resilient, more productive and more sustainable is required. The world needs to act now to eliminate hunger and malnutrition, to enable the agricultural sectors to adapt to climate change, to mitigate climate change, in order to keep it at levels where it is still possible, to ensure and safeguard everyone's food security and nutrition. And sadly, we know the people who are causing the least emissions are suffering the most. This we know. Climate change is a global concern. The global north must pay attention to all threats. Food security is a global concern. All parties must pay attention before it is too, too late. We in Pacific Civil Society share our Pacific leaders' vision for a resilient Pacific region of peace, harmony, security, social inclusion, and prosperity that ensures all Pacific peoples can lead free, healthy, and productive lives. However, climate change has compromised this vision. We have a 2050 strategy, so our blue Pacific continent that should be our North Star should survive. However, today our region, our world is in turmoil. We are beset by climate emergency. Our region is in crisis, a raging COVID-19 pandemic and a worsening socioeconomic crisis that still persists. At ground level, our civil society have observed and learned lessons about the speedy and exacting nature of change. We observe lessons about speedy responses to many and varied vulnerability simultaneously. It has taught us about the importance of being grounded in consensus and working together given even more than before. We still believe in working together as a collective for advancing Pacific regionalism based on our shared blue Pacific narratives. Our region faces a number of challenges linked to the impacts of climate change, declining forest cover, lost biodiversity with a significant depletion of certain natural resources. We need the world to pay attention now. At our Pacific Islands uh, Forum, the economic ministers and the civil societies still continue to reaffirm that agriculture is indeed a key sector. And in the, in the recovery as an alternative to livelihood options to address unemployment due to job losses and ensure food security. Therefore, we call for greater investment and support for community agriculture. Ladies and gentlemen, if I may turn to the Kyo Declaration we co-designed last week, we call for urgent and decisive actions through immediate actions on mitigation to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to align to the 1.5 temperature goal, to ensure survival of small island communities. This will be realized by completely phasing out fossil fuels. You, that comes as no surprise. You've heard us say that before. We will say it again and again, including no new fossil fuel projects, ending subsidies and financing of fossil fuels and other carbon emitting extractive industries through safe and just transition to renewable and sustainable energy by 2050 and achieving actual emission reductions at source rather than through the use of blue carbon credits and other carbon offset schemes. Urgent action on adaptation, including financing and support for community-led initiatives. Urgent progress on the issue of loss and damage by securing separate and new additional financing, establishing a global civil society task force under the Warsaw International Mechanism for Non-Economic Loss and Damage, and establishing a regional civil society task force for the same. Guaranteed access to finance and the creation of more equitable finance arrangements with a review of regional and international financial architecture with inputs from civil society organizations and other stakeholders. Ocean policies that are compatible with the climate goals, including banning deep sea mining, banning and penalizing discharge of wastes, including nuclear, protecting the oceans for the survival of small island communities and ecosystems, recognizing, respecting, upholding and valuing the contributions of traditional knowledge, culture and faith in continuing and sustaining the unique relationship between the oceans and the environment, achieving intergenerational equity and ensuring we leave behind a better world for our descendants by canceling climate debt and commitments to a debt-free future. We also call for a UN Climate Justice Day to be observed on the annual UN calendar. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, thank you. Mahalo nui. Thank you very much, uh, Madame, for 
really that, that very strong, I mean, plea and telling us how uh, the Pacific Islands are specially and specifically hit by climate uh, hazards. Um, you underline that it is a question of adaptation, but as well as well resilience, <laughs> more resilience, but in the end also survival. I mean, you gave us uh, different examples of how the, the, the food insecurity, uh, which is increasing, is jeopardizing um, the survival even of uh, children, I mean babies, children, but as well life of, uh, of women. Uh, the need for more sustainable solutions, durable solutions. Um, and if I may just, uh, I would recall your last calls for COP27. Again, working and improvement on mitigation, efforts on mitigation, good decisions on fossil fuels, uh, efforts on adaptation, including on the on finance, financing adaptation, the loss and damage as well, efforts on more taking care of loss and damage with international mechanisms on non-economic losses and equitable finance. So we are coming now to our uh, last speaker who will maybe give us precisely the reaction of uh, UNFCCC um, facing, I mean, ahead of COP27, the lines we can, we can follow maybe to be heard, to be better heard during uh, the next COP. Thank you very much to Coco Warner to join us. Thank you very much, Ambassador, Excellencies, esteemed colleagues, and ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a privilege to join you today. Um, I think we've heard very earnest and well thought through um, comments already by so many colleagues. I think what I would like to share in the closing of this panel are perhaps three things. I'd like to just, again, tip the hat to the evidence base that we have through literature assessment, such as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Give an idea of three major emphases at COP27 and then point to the road ahead. In recent reports of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, provide evidence that anthropogenic climate change amplifies risks for livelihoods, for food security and human security, and of course for people on the move, and that's what brings us here together at this second dialogue. Just last week I was in the Sahel region, and although it doesn't necessarily make international news just in the country I was visiting, just in the region that I was visiting, almost a million people were in the process of being displaced from flooding. On the continent of Africa, and many of you know this firsthand, even many more millions are affected by drought. This year, the world has again experienced extreme temperatures breaking all historical trends in regions of Asia, South and North America, small island development states, Europe, anywhere you look, we are breaking historical records. And the World Meteorological Organization indicated that there is a 40% probability that average global temperatures will cross the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold this decade. At the end of this session, we've heard very earnest political comments, comments from experts about what this means for the face of climate change, the human face of climate change, and that's really what brings us here together. Um, just one other thing that we're learning from experts is, speaking of the face, that children make up a large percentage of people on the move. When children, either alone or with their families, are uprooted and moving, it has very long 
an enduring development impact. Can't go to school, they may lack sufficient nutrition, they may lack sufficient access to health services, and of course, of all of the groups, they're very vulnerable to any number of abuses. To give a sense of the human face of climate change and the urgent need for action, often we think about adaptation as something far out on the horizon. And in past years, um, you've heard adaptation talked about almost as if it was a sequential set of actions, mitigation first, and then sometime mid-century adaptation. But for all of you gathered in Geneva and for all of you all over the world in this very important conversation, it's clear that adaptation action and additional actions that are needed to build and retain resilience to adverse climate change impacts is now. I think again, that's what's brought us here. So let's take a look at three priorities for COP27. COP27 is the first conference of the parties in the 30 year history of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, where the focus is now squarely in all areas on implementation. Um, implementation across means of implementation, that means finance, technology, and capacity, implementation of adapt adaptation planning, getting the means of implementation and doing it on the ground, and of course, mitigation. So for those of you who come to Charm or who are watching the evening news or otherwise engaged, you will hear the COP presidency and parties across the board talking about the importance of implementation. The one reason among many why, why implementation is so important is that the change that we need to make in the world doesn't happen at a meeting. It happens with all of us engaged year in, year out, every single quarter ahead of us, every single year onwards. We are all anxiously engaged in implementation and making sure that the people at the center of climate change impacts um, have a chance at a very resilient and good future. So implementation is the first. The second that I'd like to mention is, now let me go through my notes. The second part that I'd like to mention is that COP27 will have a special focus on adaptation and the need to ramp up climate finance for the most vulnerable and on issues specifically relevant to Africa. Now, just a few points about the continent of Africa, which you're very familiar with. Um, Africa has among the youngest populations in the world. In just a few years from now, 40% of the population will be in the workforce. And among all of the populations of the world, it's important to remember the need to give youth of today and tomorrow a beautiful future to look forward to. The COP presidency will be emphasizing the role of youth um, as well as the role that human mo mobility can play as it was stated before in adjusting to climate change impacts as well as the need to make sure that vulnerable people do have recourse to stable, sustainable protection and to sustainable climate resilient development. Now the third emphasis at COP27 that you will hear parties and stakeholders, and of course the COP27 president himself and all of the presidency team is supporting all segments of society. That includes all of us, all of you as what we call non-party stakeholders, this falls under the banner of inclusive multilateralism. The challenges of climate change are so large and they truly are a collective challenge as well as opportunity. This is an all hands on deck moment. All efforts are needed. And that again circles back to this important message of implementation. Um, 
and the work of course that ION and all of you are pursuing through this second international dialogue on migration is welcome and it is a needed part of the effort. We could spend the rest of the afternoon talking about the things that Ambassador Dumas asked, which is how can you make your voices productive and constructive and helpful? And there are a number of ways. I'll mention only one, but do remember there are many, many areas to be involved in your regions and sub-regions of the world. If you have a way to bring your expertise to support countries in articulating their national adaptation plans in a way that anticipates the future, this would be a very helpful area. And there are many more. It's just because of time, I'm only naming that one. As countries articulate and submit their national adaptation plans, those plans for our climate finance mechanism become almost like blueprints for the types of activities, programs, and again, implementation that need to receive means of implementation. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I wish us all a lot of luck. Some of us will see each other in just a few days in Egypt. For the rest of you, I hope that this year and next year and the years ahead, that we'll continue in this very important dialogue in our network and all of our efforts to make sure that people are safe, that we have collaborative ways to work and to navigate the adverse impacts of climate change, and that somewhere on the horizon, we will truly forge a climate resilient, sustainable future, particularly for the youth of the world. Ambassador Dumas, thank you for the time, and I'll hand the time back to you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Coco Warner, for your, for your very important voice in the name of UN. Uh, FCCC and uh, focusing and well asking us to to particularly focus on implementation on a cup of implementation and a cup of action focusing on adaptation specifically on Africa on the use of Africa and calling for a specific maybe or specific efforts to be done on the NAPS. Um, now maybe that we have heard all our panelists, we have not so much time for discussion, but we'll try to find just a few minutes. I would say that we heard expectations from Africa, from the Pacific, from LDCs, seeds and landlocked countries. We heard already the voice of uh, strong partners who are as well the European Union, but of course the convention, the UNF, Triple C, and we are uh, all convinced. This is the main, uh, maybe, uh, call or th that I could recall. We are all convinced that action is for now. It is urgent, and secondly, that we have to focus on the most vulnerable ones, those who are suffering from climate change, plus the. Uh, global crisis uh, that we are living through now. So are we well prepared for COP? How can we um, try to translate these expectations in a realistic, if I can say, ambition? Can we, what can we really expect from that COP? And will we reach a point where all these, I mean, dimensions linked to the human, human beings' livelihoods will be integrated in that COP. Do we have answers for that, or do we have um, interventions from the floor on these questions? Well, asking for the floor from the room. Paul, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, Excellencies, esteemed IDM organizers, speakers, and participants, thank you for the opportunity to speak in this debate and for stirring such an interesting discussion on the food security and climate mobility nexus. 
We have learned in these two days that climate change continues to impact food systems, affecting the lives and livelihoods of men and women in so many ways, in particular in rural areas. Rural people are exceptionally vulnerable to the impacts of climate change as they are highly dependent on natural resources for their livelihoods and they have low capacity to adapt. When rural livelihoods are compromised, people may experience high pressure to uh, migrate or may be forced, uh, forcibly displaced. They may also become trapped in high-risk areas lacking the ability to move. It is essential to explicitly consider the plight of rural populations who are on the front line of climate change impacts in planning climate adaptation and uh, mitigation. Doing so is not only a matter of social justice, it is the only sustainable pathway towards delivering on the ambitions of the Paris Agreement. We should raise the visibility of uh, human mobility in climate negotiations. FAO has joined efforts with partners to raise awareness on the linkages between climate change, migration and food security and to promote discussions at COP27 on how to foster multi-sectoral collaboration and policy coherence. FAO and the UN University will be hosting a side event looking at the integration of human mobility into national adaptation plans and nationally determined contributions from a rural livelihood perspective. The side event will be a venue to discuss how climate policies can integrate considerations on human mobility and food security and why uh, that is so important. Likewise, we should bring human mobility into the UNFCC um, C processes such as the uh, Coronavia joint work on agriculture. It is crucial also to promote the integration of climate mobility considerations in global climate platforms and funding mechanisms such as the Global Environmental Environment Facility, GEF, and the Green Climate Fund, GCF. As an accredited entity of the GCF and a partner agency of the GEF, FAO has been supporting rural communities to strengthen their livelihood resilience and enhance their capacity to adapt to a changing climate and is committed to improve even more the inclusion of human mobility in planning and programming. Concerted efforts towards inclusive climate action, resilient agri-food systems and sustainable futures are needed alongside safe and regular pathways for, these, uh, for those who choose to or need to move at times of accelerating and unprecedented changes. FAO stands ready to work with partners towards these objectives. Thank you. Thank you, FAO. Do we have other interventions? No? Well, thank you all, um, all colleagues who are here in the room as well for your patience. Thank you very much to each of our uh, panelists, I mean, to have contributed to that global reflection, I would say, and to that more, I mean, to, to an, an integrated or a more integrated view of how, um, how now the full nexus between climate change, displacement or migration, but as well, uh, the safe and uh, regular pathways have to be integrated in, in the good fora, but as well, more specifically, as we are just uh, a few days ahead of COP27, as they have to be integrated now in the discussions of COP27. We heard about expectations, we heard about what we should do or how we should uh, approach these discussions in COP27 with a model which is the Kampala Declaration for Africa. We know that there are several other strategies either already being uh, shaped in the Caribbean or in the Pacific or which will be announced. These are excellent moves I mean, to integrate the human dimension and the, of climate change impacts in COP27. 
uh, we mustn't forget about the more technical calls uh, that we, we heard about um, enforcing efforts on mitigation, the 1.5 degrees, of course, uh, and strengthening efforts on adaptation and uh, then strengthening efforts on climate finance, the responsibilities, the shared and the differentiated responsibilities, the $100 billion, but plus new, a new shaping, if I can say, of climate uh, financing with an, a balance between uh, finance on adaptation and uh, loss and damage. So we, we will maybe meet each other and a certain number of each other in COP and we hope that we will be heard, that all these voices that we heard, the very important voices, will be heard and that we'll that COP27, beyond being precisely the COP of climate justice, will be as well a COP of delivering for people. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you to, to Caroline Dumas and uh, all the panelists. And I would like to invite uh, our closing remark speakers. Ms. Francisca Mendez, Ambassador Prime Representative of Mexico, and Mr. Eugenio Ambrosi, Chief of Staff of IOM. Now, for the closing remarks, I would like, I'm honored to give the floor to Ambassador from Representative of Mexico, Ms. Francisca Mendez. Please. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambrosio, Your Excellencies, distinguished uh, delegates, both here in the room and those who are joining us on the virtual platform. It's an honor to speak on behalf of Mexico at the closing of this International Dialogue on Migration, which is dedicated to a theme that requires and demands urgent and joint action from the international community. The world is currently facing considerable crises in social, economic, health, climate, and geopolitical arenas. Understanding the impact of these events on migration is fundamental to ensure that migratory policies are comprehensive and multidimensional, that they're based on human rights and have a preventive approach and ensure that nobody is left behind. As we have heard over the last two days, the nexus between climate change, food insecurity and migration is undeniable and it's visible in nearly all regions. In the case of Mexico, we face a permanent exposure 
to multiple risks which have an impact on life and security of people as well as on the development of the country if they're not managed under an approach of resilience. In addition, various studies show that half of migrants who transit through Mexico come from agricultural areas of Central America that are most affected by disasters and climate change. Similar scenarios are taking place in the Sahel region, the Horn of Africa, in the Asia-Pacific region, to mention but a few. The disasters, which are the product of climate change and the impact on food security, are further exacerbated by the situation in Ukraine. We have seen a deepening of poverty, a widening of inequality, and a greater number of people forced to migrate in search of security or access to better opportunities and livelihoods. Nevertheless, the Usually spontaneous, disorderly, and irregular character of these migratory flows exposes people to more precarious situations, to exposure to the hands of traffickers, and it increases even more when we look at those who are in vulnerable situations, such as minors, women, uh, people with disabilities, and older people. Fortunately, we have... Uh, global frameworks that are very relevant, the GCM and the GCR, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, and the Agenda 2030. These instruments strengthen one another and must be implemented simultaneously. They set out roadmaps for public policy in countries and aim to prevent and deal with the movement of people brought about by the impact of climate change and food insecurity. And they must promote the respect of human rights, increase collaboration and cooperation on an international level, and find solutions. And in order to close the work of this dialogue, I'd like to raise five general ideas and considerations based on the debates we've heard over the last two days to ensure that we have effective measures for mitigation and adaptation to climate change, that we strengthen the resilience of communities and facilitate safe, orderly and regular migration. First, it's necessary to improve the availability of data. Despite the efforts to gather more and better statistical information on migratory flows, we still have large gaps. We need prospective and strategic data on the impact of climate change, food insecurity, and other causes of human mobility. We need them disaggregated by age, gender, migratory status, and vulnerability situations. This will allow us to anticipate what type of migratory movements will take place in coming years in order to draw up policies and plans that fit these challenges. Secondly, we need to redouble efforts to mitigate and adapt to climate change, in particular for vulnerable countries, in order to widen capacities and strengthen resilience of local communities. This means that we need to widen access to sustainable financing, to bring about measures which avoid, reduce and confront the effects of climate change, including, including loss and damages, and to help prepare better preparation planning before uh, these events. The third point is that we need to widen and diversify the offering of regular migratory routes. The offer of regular routes and humanitarian visas and education and temporary work schemes are a concrete measure which reduces vulnerability of migrants who move due to disasters and the impact of climate change, and it promotes orderly, safe, human and regular migration. There are numerous good practices and recommendations which are guided by the Objective 5 of the Global Migration Compact, which will help us achieve regular migratory routes based on human rights, which guarantee access to decent work and give a certainty to the migratory processes so that migration is an option and not a necessity. This objective was, was approved by member states in the progress declaration at the recent International Migration Review Forum. 
And fourthly, the development of prepar preparatory plans, response, and early warning in the face of climate change and its impact on human mobility must take into account specific needs and the differentiated needs of the population, in particular when we talk about vulnerable groups. And this needs the promotion of inclusive participation of the communities in the decision-making process so that we can reflect the needs and the approach based on gender, aid, and diversity. Finally, we need to accelerate the implementation of the global and regional frameworks that are applied and we need to overcome the gaps and take into account lessons learned. Two weeks before the 27th Conference of the Parties of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in Egypt, it's a time to renew our commitment to this agenda and face the realities of climate change as an accelerator of migration with a sense of urgency and ambition. Once more, I'd like to thank the IOM for inviting me to participate in this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Ambassador. Now I would like to give the floor to IOM Chief of Staff, Mr. Eugenio Ambrosi. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Diane. Uh, gracias, Senora. Thank you, Madam Ambassador, for your words. And, uh, Two days of very intense discussion, and I will not even try to summarize the, the, the depth and breadth of discussion that uh, have taken place. Um, but I just would like to highlight a few points that I think are particularly relevant as we approach COP27 and uh, uh, the next stage of the negotiation on, on such an issue uh, of importance like climate change. Um, the first aspect that I would like to underline is the challenges that we have been looking at and we have been discussing in the last two days. What is it that we are actually facing and trying to, to tackle? I think the first challenge is actually in the title of this year, International Dialogue on Migration, the overlapping global crisis. We have been looking at the interlinkages between different crises of different nature, but also at the multiple shock factors that affect each other and create the situation in many respects that we are um, facing and tackling at, at this point. And when we talk about different shock factors, we of course have been talking about slow onset of crisis as well as sudden onset of crisis and other situation that have an impact on climate change, on food security, and, or, and the resulting mobility. Um, a lot of reference and the reflection have been made in the past two days on the latest event in Ukraine and the impact that that has on food distribution right now and potentially on food production next year if the crisis continue to, uh, to, to go on in, in the same way. And that is one of the challenges that I think we have been all agreeing uh, we are facing. Another challenge, of course, is the need to address several root causes that have to do with both displacement uh, resulting from uh, uh, climate change. Um, many references have been made to the need to improve management of uh, land and water resources and how much land and water degradation impacts community and generates potential, if not real, uh, mobility in many, in many situations. Another challenge that is particularly important is the fact that all speakers and in all sessions uh, have agreed to the fact that the most vulnerable, those that are already most vulnerable for different reasons and different uh, um, conditions, are the ones most exposed to the additional vulnerability that comes from climate change and from uh, food insecurity and mobility resulting from that. So this is, in very broad strokes, <coughs> some of the area uh, that are particularly worrying for all of us and that we need to uh, find a way to respond to. And the responses are the other aspect that in the last two days we have been looking at. 
uh, and of course several have been identified and I don't pretend to um, mention them all and be exhaustive but uh, to mention some that um, we consider particularly relevant. The first that was uh, uh, an issue raised in the very opening panel yesterday is the fact that we need to assess the situation we are facing. We need to understand what it is that we have to battle against and we need to understand the nexus that exists between the different shock factors that affect mobility and food security. The other response that is particularly relevant is the need to invest in proactive action rather than just reacting. Not waiting for a crisis to explode and then try to figure out what to do and how to handle it, but try to uh, put in place measures that uh, prepare the community to respond to an upcoming uh, crisis uh, and that uh, improve the possibility of uh, corrective measure before the crisis struck. And in this regard, reference have been made several times to the proposal launched by the Secretary General of an early warning system that would serve exactly the purpose of trying to anticipate event rather than just responding. Another aspect that is extremely important talking about response is of course that food insecurity as well as climate change and the link between the two uh, don't belong to uh, one specific policy aspect of, uh, of our life but uh, require a multi-sectoral approach and a whole of government approach and I would say uh, a whole of uh, a stakeholder approach. Um, it, it is a complex situation we have to face, therefore we require a complex answer uh, to, to the situation. And one fundamental element that I think has um, emerged continuously throughout the discussion is the need to invest in resilience. And uh, the underlying factor that migration is at the same time or could be at the same time an effective adaptation strategy to climate change and food insecurity, but also a potential cause of environmental degradation or food insecurity and therefore the need to strike a proper balance in our policy response and in our operational response between these two aspects so that we could actually uh, ensure that migration responds to the need of the community affected and don't necessarily add to displacement that in many parts of the world is, is already a, a particularly serious problem. And when we talk about resilience, one of the focus needs to be on empowering women and youth in the decision-making system that would ensure um, an effective food production and food distribution and adaptation strategy uh, response. And therefore, the attention that needs to be made on some of the components of the community that very often are uh, instead much more exposed to vulnerability and to problematic situation. And of course, resilience also entails, since we're talking about mobility and migration, um, a far better migration management system across the world. A migration management system that is actually able to respond to um, the sudden um, movement of people due to food insecurity or uh, climate change or even a gradual onset of mobility um, due to a, a, a degrading situation over time. And talking about the better migration management system, uh, we obviously mean a system that ensures the effective protection of those that are on the move, uh, not just from an immediate humanitarian response point of view, but on a longer term migration management uh, optic, and that is able to efficiently and effectively counteract the shocks that are resulting from the situation that we are tackling. And when we talk about migration management, and it was uh, mentioned by uh, the ambassador just before, of course, um, we have instruments that are in place and that we need to uh, continue to implement and possibly strengthen its implementation. The Global Compact on Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration is one, as well as, of course, the, um, the SDG and the uh, Agenda 2030. We have there a roadmap that would uh, allow the international community to move ahead 
in improving a series of aspects and a series of gaps that we have in migration management that would allow us also to better manage the response to the crisis we are talking about. The last point that I would like to make is that throughout the discussion, it was clear that this is not an issue that any single actor can tackle or think of tackling alone. And the issue of partnership uh, among governments, of course, uh, but also among various stakeholders, including civil society, diaspora, and other um, organization involved is essential and is the way in which the international community should organize itself to respond. Uh, in, the, in the panel uh, just before, we have heard the example of the Kampala Declaration, which is a very good example of regional cooperation to tackle the challenges that that specific region is, uh, uh, is facing in terms of food insecurity and, uh, and climate change. And so this is the way in which I think we should um, decisively move more and more in terms of, in terms of international partnership. I would uh, stop here thanking you all for, for the participation, thanking you, Ambassador, for uh, uh, your, your closing remarks and uh, looking forward to continuing this process in the COP27, which we all hope and expect will produce further step ahead in the process of responding to the challenge that climate change is posing to all of us and to the future of our planet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Abrosi. On the end, I would like to thank to all panelists and non-moderators, especially those that have come with us for far away and those who join us online for really far away in the middle of the night. Uh, also, I would like to have a big appreciation and thanks to our interpreters. Thank you. And of course, to thank my colleagues that helped me that this actual event really have the shape as you had a possibility to see. Thank you all and see you next time.